Autumn cars, welcome. I was just going to say, did you have Len Bits OPIC on your meeting? Yeah, yeah. he's just joking. He's, he's a friend, the Duncan Lunin, so. Mm. He used to be uh, the chairman of our society in Shropshire, one of the societies here that I founded in Shropshire many years ago. Right. Um, I haven't seen him for years, to be honest. I didn't even know he was still about. Ah. <laughs> Sadly, he is. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll be, I'm not going to say no more, but yeah. <laughs> no, um, when I did the last talk for you, I did the talk on remote telescopes. Hi. And uh, I thought, well, I've got some spare time on my hands, so I'll pop in again and show you the interface to SLU telescopes um, and, and, and how you can operate it. And, uh, and it might be something you want to do in the future. It might not. But it, what I'll do, I'll show you a bit around SLU telescopes and I'll show you a little bit around eye telescopes as well. And, uh, and um, if you've got any questions after, just ask. Or if you, you know, need to talk to me privately, just ask. Don't, don't worry about it but uh it's, it's it's not a formal talk it's just just showing you around the interface on the on the internet and and and, and what's available and what's available to if you're going to do outreach to schools and what have you so i'll share the screen tell me if you see this okay yeah yeah that's it now. yep mm -hmm. okay so um there are three levels to SLU telescope. Um, there is student level, which is around about uh, £17 a year, and that will allow you to take five photographs and what they're called, they're called RoboSnap photographs. Basically, you have a look what some other astronomers are doing, and you can piggyback onto their project. In other words, you can click onto their project, and what it will also send you the photographs to, to process from their imaging runs. So that's the student level. There's a, um, an apprentice level, which is around about uh, £90 a year on average. Um, sometimes they'll do it a little bit cheaper, depending when they've got deals on or not. And with that level, you're allowed to control um, the telescopes and take five images a night. And you're also uh, able to, again, piggyback onto other people's projects, which I'll show you how to do a little bit later. And, and and from that, there is also the professional, they call as professional astronomers level. Um, and that is around about £225 a year. And that allows you to take 10 images a night. It allows you to do five robo snaps as well. So effectively, you can do five, 15 images a night, um, if you so wish. So those are the three levels. Each level includes what you can see on the screen here. And these, can you see these all right? These are called quests. Um, these are more aimed, I, I would say, if you've got, if you want to do them, do them. But I should say they're more aimed at uh, absolute beginners and they're quests where you can uh, run through a quest like this one here. We'll click on this and this is called Lunar Phases. And basically uh, the quest, it gives you a description. It tells you, how the, how the moon uh, has different phases and you run the quest. And the idea of the quest is that you um, have a fresh look at the moon. It teaches you all about the moon, uh, as you can see here. So it'll get, run you through details about the moon, what lunar phases are. Can you see, all see these things all right? Yeah. So all, all these quests are pretty pretty self-explanatory you click on them and it runs you through uh, exactly what you need to do on each quest you have to complete each section and at the end of it you get a badge now for me getting badges at my time of life for astronomy projects is a little bit um yeah <laughs> but if you're going to if you're going to get kids involved it's great to get kids involved especially you know your um sort of scouts and and cubs and and people like that um, so you, you a fresh look at the moon, you learn all about the moon, you learn what a new moon is. And then after that, you've got the waxing crescent moon, the first uh, quarter moon uh, the, the, and the full moon and then waning. But what each part of those quests do, it tells you about the features and it also asks you to um, image the moon and get your own image. And by getting each image, you can move to the next part of the quest and eventually finish the quest. Uh, I'm not going to start a quest 
uh, tonight, otherwise we'll be here all week. But there are many, many, as you can see, there are many, many um, quests that you can do. There's the Jupiter opposition quest. Uh, you've got summer and winter quest where you can, uh, it asks you to, teaches you all about the constellations of the summer and the winter, and also how to take photographs, the Cordwell challenge to take images from the Cordwell catalog, the Messier catalog uh, challenge, where you learn all about the different Messier objects, and then it teaches you how to take photographs of the Messier objects. So there's even on the these cloudy nights that we get a lot of, there's plenty for you to do just by completing the quests. There's discovery quests, looking for lunar features and identify them, identifying them, island universes, which is obviously about galaxies, uh, the life of stars, Drake's equation, calculating if there's life in the universe and where would it be and the possibilities. Um, and you've got history, you've got uh, the legend of Taurus, the golden dragon's eye, the labyrinth. You've got so many quests under different subjects that you can sit and have a go at and learn a lot from. I mean, you might have a go at some of these and not necessarily looking at getting the badges, but it might be the fact that you want to learn all about um, the, the, these different subjects. So you can go through all those quests and have a go. So even if you start at the student level at 25, um, uh, about 17 pounds a year, I'll say about $25, 17 pounds a year, you've got availability to all these quests. And these are great to run as little society projects as well. You can pick a quest and run it as a society project. Um, if, we have a, if we have a look under the guides, um, we've got the guide to the Canary Observatory. There's two observatories on SLU. There's the Canary, which is in the Northern Hemisphere, and then there's Chile, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. So you get the chance to look at and observe uh, objects south of the equator, which you wouldn't normally see from, from our location. But the Canary Islands Observatory, you will. Now we've got uh, different telescopes at the Canary Islands Observatory. It's based um, out at Tide in the Canary Islands. And we've got at the Canary Islands, we've got a Canary half meter telescope. And that is a plane wave telescope, 20 inches uh, aperture, focal length uh, f6.8. Um, the CCD is an FLI. Uh, so all the information on each telescope and the filters that are available on that telescope um, are all listed. I'll show you how to use a telescope in, in a little while, but this is just where you find the information on what telescopes are available. So everything you need to know about those telescopes are under the guides. Um, so what else have we got at the Canary Islands? We've got the half meter. Um, we've got two uh, Canary 2, which is a wide field telescope. And that is a 17 inch F6.8. Hopefully, we'll be able to look through one of these telescopes in a bit live. You can guarantee when we get there, it's going to be cloudy. Um, we've got an ultra wide field telescope for taking nice wide field views of the night sky. And that's a Teleview Optics um, aperture, 3.35 inch, and it's an F7. So it's quite a wide field of view. So you can get some nice wide field views of uh, galaxies, clusters, and, and such like. What else have we got? And we've got um, Canary 4, which is another 20 inch, but this is a nice one. We've got Canary 5 now, which is a live solar telescope. So in the day, um, and you haven't got to be a member to do this, you can do this via YouTube if you do a search on SLU Canary 5. It's a solar telescope that's viewing the sun all day when it's clear. Um, and it's a hydrogen alpha telescope. So you're seeing prominences and you're seeing loops and you're seeing sunspots. And you say so you can just click on that telescope, sit back and watch the sun. And there's a camera option on the telescope, which obviously we can't see at the moment because the solar telescope's not going to be live. But it's a, it's a Lunt uh, double stacked hydrogen alpha telescope, 60 millimeter F8.3. Um, and on the telescope, when you look at it live, there's a little camera option, a little camera icon. And if you click on that, it'll instantly take that photograph of whatever it is it's looking at at the time, and you'll be able to download that. 
So those are the telescopes at the Canary Islands. Um, if we go back, uh, back to the guides. Guides. Then we go to the Chile Observatory, which is um, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And here we go. We've got here, we've got one wide field telescope, Chile One, which is a wide field telescope. Now these, like I said, these are all gonna view objects that are in the Southern Hemisphere. So you've got a chance of taking photographs of the Mag Magellanic clouds. You've got take photographs such as Centaurus A Galaxy, um, NGC 5128, and many in the coal sack region of uh, the Milky Way. You've got the chance of taking some photographs here of objects you're never ever gonna see from the, from, from the UK or from a Northern hemisphere uh, viewpoint. So this is, an, uh, the, this is a high quality one. It's an Edge HD 14 inch Celestron uh, F11. Uh, so that's a, a quite a quick, quick telescope. If you're taking an image with that, you can get a pretty, pretty good image in less than a minute. So it's a, a really good telescope. And then we've got down at Chile as well. We have a um, an ultra uh, ultra wide field telescope, um, and that is a, a Sky Fluoret uh, ninety um, refractor, and that's again uh, a nice nice little telescope. Uh, but you get an ultra wide field of that. So if you're going to take photographs of the Colsac region or the Magellanic clouds, that will be the one the one to use. Um, we have a, a 17 inch again a 17 inch plane wave and we actually got a photograph of that one that's the telescope there down in Chile and as I say that you know if you've got if you're getting cloudy nights here in the UK uh, this is something you can go and use and still do a little bit of astronomy or learn a little bit more by taking part in the quests uh, we've got a lunar and planetary telescope down in Chile that doesn't seem to want to be online, but there you go. Um, go back. Internet's playing up. Not your internet or my internet, but their internet by the look of it. Here we go. Um, so those are the telescopes that are available. Um, what you can also go join are, uh, if we go back up here, the, the uh, community, the community run star parties. Now, these star parties, they'll become listed in this area here. And what you're allowed to do is uh, you can join into these star parties. It's a little bit like having a, um, a real star party, but you're using the remote telescopes and there's whole groups of you using remote, the remote telescopes. And SLU is specifically aimed at community. So, for instance, if you if you want to go and image an object, and those that do astrophotography need, know you need a lot of data when you image uh, an astronomical object. If you're in a community of people, you could go and image that object, and somebody else will image it, and somebody else will image it, and you'll all share the data. So you've all got lots of data that you can use to process that image. So you work as community. And within SLU as well, there are clubs. There's the Astronomy Slo Showcase Club. There's a Ptolemy Club, which is for new users. Um, and these clubs allow you to join and join in the community. And it's like they're like little worldwide astronomical societies that you can join. And they all run their own little star parties. Uh, and again, there is no cost to join these star parties. It's all part of the cost of just joining SLU in the first place. And as we see, we've got the great uh, South American total solar eclipse upcoming star party where it will be filmed. Uh, you can go on there live and watch it and join in and chat. Um, and uh, uh, for some reason, we've got a star party called Women Are From Venus. I'm not sure what the, all that one's about. Uh, might be might be worth a visit. I don't know. Uh, the Great Conjunction, December the twenty first, which is obviously the conjunction between Jupiter and uh, Saturn. So they're going to be running a star party, and they'll probably run that from uh, the the Chile telescope because Jupiter and Saturn will be high in the sky uh, in 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 Chile 
where it's quite low on the horizon here. So you'll be able to join that star party where you'll be able to watch the conjunction, take photographs of the conjunction using the telescopes in operation. Um, so all these star parties will be ava are available to you at the same, at the, at the cost of um, just joining. You don't have to pay any extra to be involved in anything. Any photographs that you take um, are put into your little folder. And I just I did a quick few snaps the other night just to try and uh, demonstrate this. And they're all put in there. And, and basically to download them, you just click on the icon and you can download it, as you can see, straight to your computer. Go back again. And uh, so we've, we've covered clubs, we've covered community and photos. Now a mission is a mission I don't like that word. I would call it a photographing run. They call them missions. And the other thing they have, they have set set, set um, settings, such as if you're going to photograph a planet, it'll have the settings for planet. This is another word that I don't like what they use. Instead of calling it settings, they call it a recipe. Now, I've never used a recipe in astronomy before. Uh, so I don't know why they call it. Maybe it's an American thing. I don't know. But they call it a recipe. But if we're going to set up a mission, you click on the little telescope. I, I'll go do that again. You've got this little observatory icon here. Click on the observatory icon, and it brings up all the telescopes uh, in the world. Now, it's saying that Canary 1 is offline, but Canary 2 is online, Canary 3 is online, and Canary 4 is online. Now, if you want to have a look at what that telescope is actually looking at, you just click on the uh, telescope, and it will take you to the telescope, and it will have a look. So when you go to some objects, it actually explains what object the telescope is looking at. If you don't want to listen to the audio, you just click on uh, don't play the audio. But the telescopes, as they're taking the images, they will constantly um, update and show you the image of, and what it's doing there. And if you see something you like, like I said, you can do a robo snap. If you see something you like, and say, for instance, that was a, an absolutely brilliant image, which you can see it actually building up as we're watching. Um, if you think, oh, I'd like that. You just hit the camera, click and click it, and it adds it into your photo directory. And that's all you need to do to take an image. So if you get an image on the screen that looks really nice and you want to, you want to, to capture that image that the telescope's looking at, you just hit the camera and that's the job done. To set up a mission um, or an observing run, you click on mission setup and you have an option. Now, if you're at the uh, student level, you'll only be allowed to use this one option, which is by SLU 1000. It's 1000 objects that are already preset into the system. If you're at amateur uh, or apprentice level, you'll be able to use by SLU 100 or by constellation, where you'll be able to select, select a com constellation, and then it will show you um, what is available in that constellation to photograph. If you've got the full astronomer level, you've got all these options available to you. So I always use by telescope. In other words, I select the list of telescopes that are available. And say, for instance, I want to use Chile 2 um, later on in the night. I'll click on Chile 2, and that will lock, give me the list of missions. Now, you might see that people have already here got missions set up. And we talked about RoboSnap. And when we talked about RoboSnap, I said that's high, piggybacking 
on somebody else's mission. Now, this guy, Oliver Scott, is going to be photographing the Helix Nebula at, uh, this is our time, um, 10 to uh, 5 to 1 in the morning. So if you click on the little icons there, it goes join this mission. And if I click on join this mission, it has now added me to his mission. So when he runs that photographic run, I will also get a copy of his photographs. So it gives you an option. If you don't understand too much about what you're looking for, you can click on missions or you may set up several runs for the Helix Nebula, Nebula yourself, but you need more data so you can piggyback onto other people's missions to pick up more data. If you want to create a mission of your own, you have to go scroll down till you find a vacant spot and there's a vacant spot. Um, so I'm going to set up a mission there. I'll click on that and it'll say now, do I want to find the object within the SLU 1000 by constellation or by catalog or by coordinates? Now, if it's uh, an object like an asteroid or a comet that's going to be a different coordinates each night, you can select by coordinates and put in your own RA and declination. But if you want to just go by catalog um, um, and then I, let's say M42, just to be simple. I select M42 um, and then it will tell me, uh, or I need to choose, sorry, I, I need to choose what sort of catalog. You've got all the catalogs here. And of course you've got the standard Messier catalog and NGC catalog. So if I select the Messier catalog and put 42, hopefully that's gonna be visible. Check visibility. Yes, that's going to be visible at that time. So you just slice, look down here and you can run what they call generic, which is just standard settings. So you can process it for yourself afterwards. Or if you want it processed before you get the image, um, you can select what type of object it is. Now we know that that's a large bright nebula. So if I select large bright nebula, it'll and uh, preview the mission. That mission um, is going to photograph Messier 42 at the time I've set it and it's, it's identified it as a large bright nebula, it's going to process it as a large bright nebula. And I click schedule mission and that should go away and schedule it when the internet decides to uh, very slow tonight. There we go, scheduled. So that at 3.35 in the morning, the Chile telescope will photograph M42 for me and then it'll load the results into my photo uh, directory on SLU. And it's as simple as that. Um, and then when, you've, uh, when your photographs come back, you can download them in two formats. You're going to your go, go, if we go back to here, it'll load them in standard photograph format of JPEG, where you can download them straight away as a JPEG. Or if you click on the missions, it'll show you the missions you've run. And if you click then on the images, it'll allow you, if you understand what fits are, if you want to go in, in depth with it, you can use the fits to process them with things like PixInsight and Photoshop, et cetera. You can actually download the fits data and process the image in more depth. So you've got an, you've got an option. You can either download it as a JPEG or you can download it as um, a fits and do a lot more processing with it. And when you've finished, it puts you into your, it puts them into a gallery on the community, and then the community can comment on on your um, processing. And maybe you need some help, and your point that you can ask, what, how do I make this better? And, and then the community joins in. So it's a massive, massive um, uh, astronomy club, really. Uh, and that's basically it. There are lots of um, objects, like I say, projects you can take part in. There are lots of clubs you can join. Um, and, and as far as taking image go, images go, and you can do it as simply as you want, want or as complicated as you want. Now on YouTube, obviously, when you, if you do decide to uh, take up this uh, project of joining SLU, 
there are many, many videos to run you through this step by step of each individual way. You're not just given the interface and told to get on with it. There is so much, so many videos on each process uh, step by step. But we'll go back and see if there's any telescopes still online and see what they're looking at. And this is supposed to be looking at Cordwell 4, uh, 16. Um, and what it does, it finds the field of view. And, and it slowly builds up the photograph over a period of five minutes till you get a decent, decent looking photograph. Now, there is another piece of software um, that's available that runs alongside. Uh, is it on here? Da, 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 da. Don't think I've got that one. Could be that one. No. There's a free piece of software out there, and I'm just seeing if it's on this, on this, uh, if, if I've actually got this. No, I haven't got that one. But there's a free piece of software that runs along that you can download from SLU, and it gives you, you can type in the name of the object you want to look at, and it gives you, you click on the telescope, and it gives you the field of view. It shows you what the object will look like through that telescope. So that's, that's SLU. So is that something you'd enjoy doing? Certainly for thought. Um, yeah. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. If, if you want to get into, as I say, this is a basic level. Um, the photography on here is, is very, very basic. Um, you can't really change many settings. You, like I say, you can select uh, the, 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 is it a bright nebula? Is it this? Is it that? You can select the generic settings and then play with the images yourself. Um, but again, the exposure levels at times aren't long exposures like you can do on some of the more bigger commercial systems like eye telescope. Um, if I click on this, has that come up as eye telescope? Has that come up now? Yeah, change yeah, speed. Yeah. Mm. So we'll look at the, the only one that's going to be online at the moment is um, Spain. So eye telescope. This is a little bit more advanced and it's a little bit more expensive. Um, but this gives you a lot, lot more control over the telescope. So you can look at Spain and you can see from the observatory that the night, the, the moon's up there, obviously. And you can see through the all sky camera of, of what our telescope is looking at. If we go into a telescope at Spain, um, this one is Side and Spring, Australia, by the way. Um, they are Side and Spring Observatory. You've got one in New Mexico, which will be open later when it uh, becomes night in New Mexico. And then even later on, you've got one at Sierra Nevada. Uh, there um, but the one we'd concentrate on at the moment is Spain because that's the one that's open so we can go to uh, to Spain and the telescope that's uh, in Spain uh, uh, that we're looking at is a, te a telescope plane wave 318 mil and that's the basically the telescope um, we can have a look at what this guy who's on it is doing. He's trying to image IC 1396, and we can see the, you can actually see the telescope guiding and running there at the moment. You can see it running the guiding information. Um, if you want to take an image and you've never taken an image before of a, of a, a night sky object, and you just want to have a go at this, you click on one click image, and it gives you a list of all the objects that are available that night. Now, if you're the one that's logged on to the telescope at that point, um, at the moment, it's somebody else is using it, but we can see what they're doing. Um, if you want to, say, take a photograph of the Andromeda Galaxy, you would just click submit and it would take the photograph of the Andromeda Galaxy for you there and then. So you can look at what objects are available, decide you want to take a photograph of it and click submit and it will do that for you. If you want to run um, a proper imaging run, if we decided here we wanted to again look at uh, M M42, you type in M42, it gets the coordinates for you. It tells you the times that you can image from and to. So it's imaging start time is 11.37. And the last time you can do any imaging of that is 5.32 a.m. So it's put the co coordinates in for you. Now you can select um, how many images you want to do of a certain filter. You can click on 
I want to do three images using the red filter and I want them to be five minutes, 300 seconds. So you click on that. You can do the same again and you may want to do three images with the green filter, 300. And you might want to do the same again, three um, with the blue and it's 300. So then that will be your imaging run set up. Um, you can then decide if you want to dither it. Now, dithering means that it photo moves the CCD camera very slightly to eliminate noise or, or, or artifacts in the image. So I always select that so it's uh, less noisy. And you can decide whether you want it to preview the, the, the images as you're taking them. Uh, if you're not going to be about and you're just going to leave it, do it, just say skip previews and it runs through quicker. But if you want to see the images, you might only want to see the first and last. So you just click on that and then you just click acquire image and the telescope will go away and take that image for you. You can um, have a look at the, uh, uh, the observatory view. And this is the computer screen in the observatory of the telescope. You can't make any alterations to that, but you can see what's going on and what the telescope is actually doing and where it's pointing. So it is always useful if you if you quite up on astrophotography, you will probably understand what is going on here and whether everything that is going on is is what you were uh, is what you expect. Um, but if we go back and have a look at this guy, he's taking still taking his image of IC one three six nine. So that's probably going. He's using Oxy three, but you can have a look to see if he's selected preview images. You'll be able to see what he's taken, and that's basically um, the image that is taken, one of the frames of the image that is taken. So you can just about see the nebulosity there. Of course, he'll take many images and that'll build up. So it's a very flexible um, system. Uh, there are, I mean, if we go back home here um, to eye telescope, if you're going to use the, the Australian telescopes, for instance, they range from very small refractors, which are great because they're wide field, um, all the way up to uh, very large telescopes at 20 inch. Um, so you can select any of those telescopes. And of course, Australia at the moment is closed. Um, so, you know, the, the observatory is not going to be open at this point in time, but you can still click on the, uh, on the telescope and, uh, and have a look. So t telescope 10 in Australia is a um, – so we have a look what images are available. So you can see, obviously, in the Southern Hemisphere, you've got some beautiful images available to take photographs, images we're never going to see. You've got the Eta Carina Nebula, the Jewel Box, Centura A, uh, the Southern Ring Nebula, um, and loads of NGC objects and galaxies. They They – they're lucky down there. They seem to have a lot more than we do. Uh, I mean, look at that. Just look at that list of objects that's available with that one telescope um, at this time of the year. So it is, it is amazing. But um, as I say, this is a little bit more expensive. It runs out. Uh, if you're going to use one of the smaller refractors, um, you, you, you're going to be talking at probably about £20 um, a month. Um, if you're going to be using the larger ones, um, you're going to be talking around about £80 a month to take two or three images. So it is a lot more expensive, but the quality is a lot, lot higher. And if I go into my uh, photograph um, resources, here we go. Now we can see here, this image here. Can you see those photographs okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. This is the small Magellanic cloud, which I took with one of the small refractors um, out in, in, in down in Siding Spring. Um, so you can, you can see the quality is quite good. So if I click on that. So that was just simply a uh, about five minute exposure using one of the refractors and you've picked up the nebulosity in the small Magellanic cloud uh, there. Now I did do a test on a one click image um, and this was a one-click image uh, using uh, earlier on in the year, looking at the Hart uh, Nebula. 
using a telescope in Spain. So that was taken with, you could take that with no photographic knowledge at all. All you would adjust are the levels in Photoshop. So this is the type of thing you can achieve very, very quickly with very little knowledge. Uh, but as I say, as you get more in depth to, uh, with it, you can then really start to take some, uh, some nice photographs. And that was using a telescope in New Mexico. And that's the Rosetta Nebula in, uh, in narrow band. And that's, that's taken with a small refractor. And there's about a 20 minutes exposure altogether there. So the, these sort of things you can achieve very, very quickly with very, very little knowledge. Um, a nice using one of the refractors in um, sight and spring, because in the summer, these constellations and these objects are, are directly above. So you've got better seeing conditions looking directly above. And that's obviously the Triffid Nebula, the, the, the uh, Lagoon Nebula and, and an IC object there. Uh, NG, sorry, NGC 6544 there. So you can see these objects embedded in the Milky Way and you can take these simply with a small refractor from Australia. And that probably would have cost you around about four pounds to produce that image and uh, process it. So there is, there is so much you can do um, using these telescopes. But I, I, I hope it's a little, you know, to give you a little bit of guide there to, to, to how you can use remote telescopes. I thought I'd nip along and just give you a little run through because I, I know last time I went through, this is what you can get. And I just throw, thought I'd take it a little further for you. Um, but if you want, you know, if you want to ever just want to log in with me on Zoom and just run through it one to one, just drop me an email and I can do that. That's not a problem at all. And we can uh, we can go through it again. But it gives you a little bit of overview of what you can do. So I don't know if it's something you'd be interested in. But I think the quest side of it is great for getting, you know, getting youngsters involved or newcomers and getting them to do the quest. You learn so much. I mean, I've took, took a couple of quests and learned quite a bit, to be honest. But I, I wasn't very pleased when they awarded me a badge. You've got a badge now. <laughs> You can wear your badge. You've got a Ptolemy badge. Oh, gee. Um, <laughs> but I find that bit a, a bit, you know, if you're experienced, it's a little bit um, gimmicky, a bit American-y. Uh, but uh, but the, the actual quests themselves, they have got some great quests. I mean, the one for doing the... I look the, good. Yeah, the one for doing the features on the moon, the lunar phases, is great because it asks you to photograph the moon at different phases, understand why it's at the fate, why those phases are, are there, then there's even a little bit you can get more in depth and measure the heights of lunar craters, uh, sorry, lunar mountains and crater walls by the shadows. And so they're little projects you can just sit and have a go at at home. Um, and as I say, we, we have lots of cloudy nights and you get so many people saying, oh, I can't do any astronomy tonight because it's cloudy. There's plenty you can do for very little cost. You know, if you just join for, for 17 pounds a year, and then you've got access to doing lots of little projects and challenges and joining in um, communities, astronomical communities across the world. I mean, I, the one club I'm in on there at the moment is um, the Astronomers Club. And each night we've got astronomers from Australia in there. We've got astronomers from Chile. We've got astronomers from India. We've got astronomers from uh, all over Europe, uh, the States all together all exchanging ideas and it's like it's kind of like the zoom meeting we're having now but right. it's international it's all over and everybody's got that you know hunger to do something and then of course you then you come up with ideas and and then they'll you'll create a star party through the ideas and and all join in and exchange data so it's just opening up your astronomy and you can join as a club you haven't got to join as individuals you can join as a club and then you can have your club as part of another club, if you like. Oh, so okay. it opens up your club to the world mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and for very little cost. So it's just something I think that uh, yeah. mm -hmm. it's nice to have these astronomical communities and, 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 you know, you learn something and you can also teach people something as well, because obviously everybody's got their own bit of experience and you can pass it on, on to other people, which is nice. And I like it when you get the youngsters in there who want to learn and you pass on some knowledge to them and then they come back, oh, I've done this, I've done this, you know, and they show you what they've done and you feel quite, you know, well, you know, I've taught them to do that. And it's, it, it might not be somebody just down the road. It could be some young lad 
in a little village in India, you've just taught him how to take an image or what that actually, why, why the moon's at that phase or why does the moon have tide, cause tides, all these sort of things. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a worldwide community and it's growing. Um, and it's all, when you log on, it tells you who's online and from what country and, and the rest of it. So you can always click on individuals. And I found the one thing I've found since the lockdown is a lot of retired people have joined from around the world, especially America. A lot of American retired people right. have joined and they, they really are keen. I mean, what the one guy that I talk to a lot, he's a retired biomechanical engineer, Frank in uh, Wisconsin. And he's, he's really keen. And uh, he's, he's, he's gone from absolutely never looking through a telescope to actually producing some really, really nice images within a month, you know, of just yeah, sitting yeah. and talking to other people. So you can go on every, every night. There's some, some people on, you can just go on like this and talk around to people around the world about your passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's brilliant because I'm in Scotland. We get very, we get very few and far between clear nights. <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> same here in North, but on the North Welsh border, I'm sure. I'm sure down the south of England they get it okay, but I know we don't get many. And uh, so, I mean, my job is basically running remote telescopes for schools and that. So it's something I do from here anyway. But I do like to go outside, as you can see behind me on me picture. Aye. Aye. Uh, that's the take, that's the comment taken in our village. Um, I do like to go out with a DSLR camera and get some nice night shots, but it's very far and few between. I mean, I was intending going out tonight with the DSLR, but it's cloudy. Um, there's a massive sunspot just coming around the limb of the sun, an absolutely huge one, apparently. So, I'll, right. I'll, so I'll get the solar scope out tomorrow. What's mm. it forecast? Cloud. Rain. <laughs> Rain and cloud. So you guarantee that sunspot will go all the way across. The last one did, went all the way across the sun before I was able to view the sun. And now there's another one coming. It's forecast cloudy for a week. So at least I can go into the SLU telescope tomorrow if, if the sun's out, click on the solar scope. And observe it, and probably photograph it. So okay. you've got that option. And as yeah. I say, it's if you join as a club, if you contact them and say we're a club that want to join, they'll come up with a price for the club, and it'll be probably a lot lot cheaper than you joining as individuals. And you'll all have access then. And as a club, you can go on and create your own little area on there as as your own club, and get other people from around the world to join in with you. Yeah, right. Right. It sounds interesting. Right. Right, because my tell my wee star wave uh, seventy <laughs> hasn't he been out out, out its case th this year? It's, <laughs> it's the been weather's awesome. been terrible. <laughs> well, the only time I've done anything, I went to photograph the Milky Way. We got a reservoir in Wales called the Alwyn Reservoir, not too far from here. Right, and I've been over to that, and um, I've been over. I don't know if I can get that on on the screen, and that's the only time. I've managed to get out uh, to do anything. It's been absolutely diabolical. Um, but I did. I was quite happy uh, with this photograph. Uh, if I can download it. Uh, there we go. Boom, 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 boom. Come on. And then in the summertime, it's too light to do anything. So <laughs> that's a problem, you know. Aye. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, we have got some really dark skies now. If I can share this picture with you, I don't know if I can. Let's see. Um, there we go. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, that's that's only a few miles up the road. But it's a very rare occasion that I could get out there. And, of course, under lockdown, there was nobody else about at all. It was great. Everybody had stopped at home. I just drove out there late one night, never saw a soul. And that's me on the bridge. I, I set it up on time lapse and I put me, me shining the torch on the bridge. And then um, it, and that's just, you know, about four simple exposures with a DSLR camera of the Milky Way at the reservoir. Um, Brilliant. Mm -hmm. But it's very far and few between, you know, right. mm -hmm. like yourselves. It's, it just doesn't right. happen very often. And, you know, I've had three chances after the whole summer to photograph the Milky Way. So I spent most of my time doing the remote stuff. Took loads of photographs remotely, but nothing locally, really. And uh, 
Yeah, because any time you've been even at um, public outreach events, you know, the two that we normally go to, I mean, we've been lucky if we've had like one one clear night out all the time, one or two clear nights out all the times that we've actually been doing these. Yeah. Well, I managed to photograph the full moon with my Olympus point and shoot. Oh, right. A couple, of, yeah. a couple of months ago, and I even managed to get the the uh, the shadows round about it. So I was very pleased with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. But as I say, if you decide to go down that road, that or I telescope road, and you say, I don't, I'm not sure how to do this, just just drop me an email and then I'll set up a little Zoom session to to run you through the bit you're stuck with. That's not great at all. Thanks. Excellent. Right. So any any questions for Pete? No, it was uh, it was great though. Um, Aye, it really yeah, was. Very, very interesting. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's something, like I say, as well, the nice thing is, I, do, I, I mean, it, it's, before I go to bed at night, I know this sounds sad, uh, but <laughs> I'll log on to SLU and I'll look at what the telescopes are looking at and uh, and I'll click on one and just, just, just have a look at what they're looking at and then just sit and watch it build up. And, you know, it, you kind of even feel then as you go into bed, you're still doing a little bit of astronomy before you go to bed. <laughs> um, and if you start late at night like that, you end up being a ball the night. Yeah, it does happen, David. It does happen. I have to say, I've, so I've suddenly looked on it and I thought, oh, I'll run a mission a bit later and I'll do this and I'll do that. And then you kind of, it's three or four o'clock in the morning, you think, no, I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I mean, if you're outside, you it's different. But when you're kind of already in the house and you're still sitting up all night running telescopes, but you can, you know, the options there. If, you, if you're a person that wanders about the house at night, sleepless, just log on the telescopes and have a look. Gives you something to do. They soon send you to sleep then. Set up a mission. Hey. If you set up a mission, yeah. How often does the weather uh, cause it to fail? Um, less than it does here. I mean, I've I've had a few missions fail because of weather. Uh, but you can. There's a little box you can click on to say rerun when the weather's good. So what it'll do to look next night at the same time, and if the weather's good, it'll run it then. All right. Um, right. I'm going to wonder if you lose the session because it looks like there's a lot of people on and getting a. a, a yeah, yeah. I mean, the, basically, uh, the, it depends. Uh, if you go, if you say I want to run a couple of sessions in three nights' time, um, and you log on now and have a look for three nights' time, you tend to find that all the missions are empty. People tend to always go on on the morning to run the set up the missions for the night, but there's always a couple of two or three free missions that you can you can get on. But like you say, you might look down and think, "That's what I wanted to image tonight. That person's going for that tonight." And then just click on the join the pro, join the mission, and and it'll run it with and you'll you'll take part in that mission as well. And it'll How give far you, in advance can you set them up? Uh, a week one week yeah because i wanted to set up one for the conjunction um in in uh december the 21st and it won't let me go that far mm. ahead mm. Uh, i telescope will i telescope you can set up a mission uh, or, or or an observing run as they call it because they're australian you can set up an observing run 12 months in advance um but uh with the with the slew i think they give you about a week which is, I find that a bit of a restriction, really, because it might be an event you want to uh, have a go at. But, but uh, yeah, with iTelescope, <laughs> you can go on and set something up this time next year, if you so wish. Can I ask a question about the number of photos you're allowed? You're, you're allowed, um, it, like I said, on the, on the full astronomer, which is the £225 a year one, <laughs> you're allowed, uh, it's 10 photographs a night, and five mission piggybacks. So that's effectively, you can get 15 right. photographs a night. What I wanted to ask was, uh, in, in, w one of the t telescopes you looked at, you were showing us, you clicked on uh, nine photos. Now, do you get, would that be five photos free, but you have to pay for the other four? No, no, you'll get the, the if you click on, how would how do you mean if you? I, I think there's was, there was one of the telescopes that you had various options for, uh, choosing how many pictures you wanted 
an icon to the you chosen name picture. Oh, that was on that was on eye telescope. That's slightly different to SLU. No, that one you just you you pay for the amount of time. Okay, that, you so that wasn't SLU. Right? No, you, you use you you use uh, points. You buy points on that one, and okay. effectively you've got a bank of points. It's like a bank account, and you 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 use the telescopes till your points run out. Effectively, right. I just wondered with SLU whether you could get more than five if you paid for the extra ones. Um. If you've, like I said, with a slew, you're going to get 15 a night, um, yeah. and that's your limit. You can't pay for any more. That's it. Okay. Um, and if you only pay the basic level, uh, which is uh, 17 pound a year, you can get five a night, and you can't get any more. You've just got to, you've got the three levels, and you pay for which level you want, and you're stuck on whatever that level allows okay. you to Thank do. You. There's no, there's no way of, of advanced, advancing that. I telescope. If you take. Uh, nine photo nine frames for a photograph nine nine like i said nine photographs and you want 10 and you've run mm. out of points it'll say do you want to buy extra points mm. to do this and you'll buy the extra points at that point in time points a lot there mm. at that point in time so you can i telescope's flexible you can you can keep buying points and I've, i think i said on the when i did the talk before it becomes addictive so never 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 store your <laughs> credit card details <laughs> Not because I'll get nicked, because you'll click on, yeah, I want more points, I want more points, I want more points, and then you'll get your credit card bill. And then you'll be going, why did I buy those points? Because it, it has happened. I've, I, I have seen people run up bills of thousands by just going stupid on it and getting in, addicted to it and thinking, oh, I just need more data, I just need more data, I just need more data, and they keep clicking on <laughs> If they're on one of the big telescopes, then it becomes costly. But the small telescopes aren't so costly. But if you've got to put your credit card detail, details in each time, you'll think about it. Mm -hmm. You might not. You might still put your credit card details <laughs> in and, and be done with it. But it depends how rich you are, I suppose. But, um, you know, it, 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 it is a, it's an addictive thing because once you start to get decent results, you want to do more. And it's the same if you've got a telescope in the garden, you take a decent photograph, you want to go out and do better. Um, and it's the same with remote telescopes. You get a decent photograph and you want to do better or you might want more data for it. But the beauty of it is you can go back, say, for instance, you work through the summer on a particular object. Well, next year you can add data to it. You know, you, you might have four hours of data on a particular object next year. When that comes around again, you can add more data to it. So it's something you can always come back to each year uh, and, and build on. You know, the object's not going to go away and the telescope's not going to go away. So... It's, 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 you've got, so, like I say, the eye telescope is very flexible. SLU is not so flexible. But if you want a lot of data, join in with the other astronomers on their exchange data. Say, are you doing the Helix Nebula tonight? And they might say yes, and I'll say, I'll do it. And then we'll add our data together. So you get more data for, for, for no more cost. Great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Aye, really good. Very informative. It's just another thing to do, isn't it? It's, Aye. It's, I mean, I, you, you said that YouTube gives you all the, the details how to do it all. Is that yeah. what you said? Yeah, just do a search on SLU YouTube and there's everything you need to know is on there. Okay. And um, if you get really, really stuck, like I say, contact me yeah. and, or contact somebody on SLU and they'll be only too willing to help. Mm. There's, there's okay. No, never right. any Great. issue about that. And there's so many people on there that will help you. Mm. Um, Too many, maybe. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> yeah. The trouble is you can get it, you get into a forum. Well, I went into a forum the other night um, and it was the same as what happened tonight a little bit. We, um, we went on to talk about a particular object and an image in this object. And I think for the first three hours, we were discussing Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> But it's great because you're discussing it with Americans and I haven't seen a Republican. I haven't seen a Republican yet in any of the chats. Let's just put it like that. Oh, no. They're hiding. Aye. Aye. Hiding under Aye. a rock. Aye. It's the same round here. We're, we're a massive conservative area around here. I'm not, but they are. And uh, mm. I can't find anybody that voted for them. Yet we're, <laughs> they Never get here. <laughs> Well, Gordon says that they're the most socialist government we've got at the moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at least all the guys that run telescopes are Democrats. <laughs> oh. oh, well, that's good. 
yeah, no, yeah. Surprise. There's no voting or anything like that. So it's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so okay. I, hope, I hope i hope that's pointed you in the in the right direction and as i say yeah, just give me a shout just one question oh, it has. just one Thank question yeah how, no. how fast an internet uh, link do you need to uh... it, it, it's slow you can do it off a mobile phone because you're only you're only just clicking on an instruction on a website that's all you're doing. And the only time you need a fast, not a fast internet, a decent internet connection is when you're downloading your data. But right. it, I mean, if you've got a slow internet connection, it'll just take longer to download when you've got it. Yeah, the, re the reason I ask is our society works from a church hall uh, when, when we actually have meetings. And if one wanted to demonstrate, as you have tonight, um, you could probably do that using a, there is Wi-Fi in the church, but it's not very fast. Yeah, yeah, you could or, or or if somebody's got a if somebody's got a mobile phone with four G on it, or, or or dare I say five G, uh, <laughs> theories. Um, if somebody's got a mobile mobile phone with, with a decent interconnect internet connection, and you've got a laptop, you can you can piggyback off the mobile phone. If you just go into the, the laptop and tell it to use a mobile phone as your internet connection, it will. Mm. Good, thank you. And that's all you'll need. That's all you'll need. So you, you've got you've got the facilities there to do it, as long as somebody's got an internet connection somehow. Mm. It doesn't need to be fast. So it'd be fine. What I was going to say as well is, if you're short, um, um, uh, if you're ever short of a speaker, I've just put a talk together about the sun. So if you if you're short at any point, just give me a shout. Mm. Right. Um. Or, or, or all the music. I know somebody was on about the music and the yeah, music. it was me. <laughs> yeah, the music you won. That, that always goes. To, I tell you, I did it for the Cambridge Society the other night. The music one, and and I, you see all the boxes down the side as you're doing the talk, and there's about five or six of them up and dancing. Um, <laughs> and I did it live. I did it live last year at a festival, and I got Nigel Hembest. If you know Nigel Hembest. Mm -hmm. uh, as astronomy writes the, the sky guide the philip sky guide he used to work with heather cooper but heather cooper's recently died really? um, yeah. oh. he was up at the front dancing so i had to give him a prize <laughs> <laughs> but it is a bit of a it's a bit of a fun talk that one it goes on for about an hour and a half and it's just it takes you back to some of the music you probably listened to when you were younger like telstar and stuff like that did you mention hawkwind yes well, that's a blast from the past, right? Well, enough. <laughs> they're, they're all good friends of mine, and I play bass with them a, a few times. Oh, my but goodness. Before, before I did astronomy, uh, eight years ago, I was a professional, from my school days till eight years ago, I was a professional rock musician. And I just, really? Yeah. Uh, with Hawkwind, and, and I, I worked with Budgie um, and many others. Oh, Budgie, God, I remember seeing them. Well, at I, was least. There, <laughs> I was there to a manager. Um, oh God, Leith Town Hall, they were yeah. awful. <laughs> <laughs> going thought, going back to Heather right. Cooper, uh, yeah, she used to do brilliant um, tapes for schools. I used yeah. to use them with the Astronomy yeah. Club at school, and she opened our observatory in 1988. Yeah, for a signature on a rhythm that was cut at the time. She was she she did she was like the ITV's version of Patrick Moore. Aye, aye, yeah. Yeah. aye. I watched her on, on the telly. Aye, she, ended, she, she was ended. president of the uh, mm. at the time. Yeah, yeah. She was a really nice lady, and Heather and, and mm. Nigel. Uh, he's, everybody used to think Nigel and and Heather were married, but they weren't. They were just business partners. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah. Coop Productions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I have every year he does his book. I always have four or five images. In, in his book and the 2022 one, which we're actually put, they're putting together now. Um, they've changed the style of it because Heather Cooper's no longer here, so her name doesn't appear on it. So they've changed the style of the book. I've got a couple of my images on the front cover this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just hidden away inside this time. I can get on the front cover. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so, so if, you ever, if you ever want, just for a bit of fun, the music one, just mm -hmm. to sit back and enjoy, put your feet up and listen to a bit of music and we go back to Weinstein playing the violin and all sorts. <laughs> well, that'll be good. And then modern day stuff with Jethro Tull jamming. Your your one of your one of your Ian Anderson, one of your locals, um, jamming away there with uh, Katie Coleman on the space station. He's on the ground. She's on the space station. They're both playing flute together. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Mm, that was good, actually. That was. I was very impressed with that. Uh, Brian May, a bit about Brian May and, and that sort of stuff. Patrick Moore. What, what about Pink Floyd? Did you ever play with them? No. I, I've only ever spoken to David Gilmore on the phone when I told him he was wrong about Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> We wouldn't like that. <laughs> he, said, he said, listen to the end of the album. He says, if you come and listen to the end of the album, it says that there's no dark side of the moon. He says, Rich is all, is a, he said, there's an Irish guy saying there's no dark side of the moon at the end. He said, he said, it is all dark. And he said, and that's the doorman to the recording studios at Apple. And he was an Irish fellow and he asked him to come in and say that. And he goes, there's no dark side of the moon. It's all dark. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you listen carefully, it's just right on the end of the, that album. Yeah. Which is yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it, yeah, no, Pink Floyd, one of my favourite all time bands. Oh, so. when I saw them at Earl's Court years ago. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, unbelievable. Shame they, uh, they packed up. But oh, well. But, yeah. yeah. They're, they're all still uh, going. So, that's okay, even though they're separate. Yeah, except for one who's dead. Well, yeah. It's not yeah, going yeah. too well. No. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe he is in another life. <laughs> oh, was jamming with Jimi Hendrix and Lemmy from Motorhead. Oh, God. <laughs> another another um, uh, well-known musician, and he's, he's plays our Eagles or something, they, an American mm. band, and I talk to him quite regularly. He's Rick Armstrong, Neil Armstrong's son. Oh, really? Mm. All right. Mm. Musician. I've met Neil Armstrong a few times, interviewed him for the BBC. And uh, and he's a massive music was a massive mu music fan as well. And he, the last band he ever saw was Marillion. He came over to London to see Marillion because <laughs> his son's band was supporting them. Mm. Wow! Well. I came back to the south of Scotland, didn't he? Neil? Mm. He, he's well. If uh, is it? Um, oh, um, Ish. Was was kind of that Denholm. Too. Denholm. Mm. He's got a plaque. Now, I went up to see this plaque because um, I expected, because he, he, he travelled by train from Shrewsbury, uh, came up to Shrewsbury near where I live, got off, went to a restaurant called Paolo's, um, and they've got the plaque in there to say Neil Armstrong et here. He went to a <laughs> clock shop, then he went to York, and by then they knew he was coming up to Denholm in Scotland to find his, ans find his ancestry. So I went to Denholm expecting to see a museum and all the rest of it, and all I found was a plaque outside the public toilets on the car park. About the big <laughs> I know. Time. I thought, is that it? One is that how you've... But apparently it's somewhere nearby. There's there's some sort of museum. But you'd have thought the actual town where his, his ancestors came from, they'd have done more about it than just sticking a plaque by the public toilets, wouldn't you? Nice. <laughs> I have a photograph somewhere of me uh, sitting by this... Um, standing by this plaque in the public toilets because my brother says, come and see it. You've got to see Sneil Armstrong. And I said... Is that it? <laughs> um, at, the time, at the time of the millennium, I published a local book for uh, Kirk Linton and surrounds for a lady who got it. Yeah. They got, they got grants at the time and she got all stuff from all the local people. And it's got a full half page in about Neil Armstrong and interviewing the lady he came to see. I've just looked, yeah. it should be up there somewhere. I just haven't found it in the short time. I've yeah. Got. Um, it, it had quite a lot of detail. It, mm -hmm. it was done in, as I say, twenty years ago now, so I can't really remember the detail. But I've got one copy here somewhere. Have you seen that sunspot yet, Lynn? Well, it's been cloudy here today. I've seen it online. Right. Yeah. So uh, watched it this morning. So it's it's massive. There's three all together at the minute coming. Uh, on the desk, but it's a huge one coming around. Mm -hmm. So interesting to see how that develops. It's mm -hmm. bound to be cloudy, like we say. <laughs> uh, it is today and tomorrow, but Wednesday and Thursday are supposed to be good here. So the aye, aye. Aye. will be out and it should be fully on the disc by then. So worth seeing. It could just be, you know, quite dormant. I mean, big spots often are, but it depends what yeah. comes around comes around after it. So mm. it, it could be just the, the, the front spot of or something more complex. We just have to wait yeah. to see. I'll get my binoculars out and have a look on Wednesday because it's, as you say, it's supposed to be nice weather on Wednesday. Yeah. 
yeah, exactly. Wednesday's a good day. And as I say, it should have rotated nicely onto the uh, southeast quadrant by then. So, yeah, be worth looking at. And nice. that's that um, single penumbral spot that's been in the centre of the disc, that's developed some followers today mm. as well. So that, that's maturing quite nicely. So it'll be interesting right. to have a look in H-Alpha and see what's what's happening there as well. Yeah, yeah, well, well I found it. I don't know oh, if you can yeah. see it, but... Uh, Minute. Get, get, uh... All right. Yep. Yep. But uh, there's an article there, and he came to see this lady, uh, Sadie. Where's the detail? Of the pictures there, can't I? On a recent visit, courtesy of NASA, the picture. <laughs> but that was 2000, the year 2000, anyway. All right. It's out of print now, but. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, last was it not last year, the year before, uh, when it was a 50th anniversary, I was I had to go down to London. I was invited to London to do um, a talk. At, it's an after dinner speech at Mansion House. It was 400 lords and ladies. And uh, because it was a 50th anniversary, they wanted me to go to do a talk about the moon landings because I'd interviewed Neil Armstrong. And I had to sit actually in the Queen's chair to do to do the talk and to talk to 400 lords and ladies how would you talk to 400 lords and ladies for seven minutes about the moon landings <laughs> so what i chose to do was talk about my personal experience of it as a child and i think that went around well i got a photograph here of uh, a, a very rare photograph you'll never ever see me in a suit again <laughs> i mean i'm sitting next to, i'm sitting next to the lady mayoress of london discuss, discussing rock metal um but there we go uh, oh, yeah. you scrub up well. I wasn't, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a rare occasion that I have to say, but it was a, it was a weird experience because, um, like I said, for the night I had my own personal servant at the table, yeah. pulled my chair out, poured my wine, and and did all that, and uh, I had a, a thirty page document beforehand on etiquette, on how I had to behave, and. <laughs> I don't think any of that came into play. The lady in the dress was wild. She was <laughs> when I got up to do the um, to do the talk, she pinched me backside and said, "Go for it, Pete." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things I was supposed to start with, uh, my lady, uh, lords, ladies, and gentlemen, and sheriffs, and, and and you're supposed to mention not mention. I wasn't supposed to mention the Lord Mayor because that had come before on the last uh, speaker. Uh, when they were doing, discussing their finances. And uh, she says, you're not mentioning the Lord Mayor. And I said, well, no, it's not in my etiquette thing to do. She says, well, I want you to do it. He's my husband. He's worked hard to get to be Lord Mayor. So I had to put his name in. And when I stood up and said it, they all kind of looked at me and said, you shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> and I was told not to engage with the audience. You had to look over them, but at the same time, read from your podium, but you weren't to engage. And of course, they said, you're the first external speaker we've ever had in 400 years uh, for this event. And so I, um, I engaged with the audience. I was the first speaker, so I thought, I'm going to do it. So I engaged with the audience and they were all coming out to me afterwards outside of Mansion House going, well, we love that. It's good fun. Good fun. Because I was last. They were all drunk by then. So it was good. <laughs> but it was um, it was all for charity. All the money goes to uh, they were giving it to the NHS, some NHS charities. And it was a thousand pound a ticket to go, and uh, the, so they raised they raised four hundred thousand pounds for, for charity. Oh! And they do this three times a week. Three times a week. Three times a week, yeah. <laughs> wow! Good. Uh, they have different different uh, themes. What they do, they take an order, and the order I did was uh, I've got a thing here somewhere. It was the order they they pick a different order, and it was the order of the master playing card makers. And uh, of course, it was Neil Armstrong. We all got presented well, presented with these royal cards. There was four hundred sets made, uh, three hundred and eighty went to royals and minor royals, and uh, nineteen went to um, uh, the lords and ladies, some lords and ladies there. And then I got one set, and they're all all um, astronauts on the cards. And they're all silver gilded, real silver gilded. All right. 
Lovely. Well, yeah. Very special. So that's kind of really rare, that is. I mean, I'm never going to part with that. How are the other half lives, eh? Uh, for, for, for about two hours, how the other half lives, and then I was back to normal. I was back to my hotel room. I mean, it was weird. We were taken over by a, a chauffeur-driven Mercedes from our hotel in... Um, uh, I can never remember the name. Uh, not, not Knightsbridge, but anyway, out that way, to Mansion House, to another hotel where I had to change into me um, regalia, which they hired for me, because uh, I don't own a white tie suit. Um, and then I had to dress up in that, and then me and my wife went into the thing. She couldn't sit by me. She had to sit at the end of a table. And uh, I sat in the middle. And then I did my bit. And then we went back, got changed out of my suit, did an interview for the Times, the Telegraph and Radio 4, back to my hotel uh, in my jeans and T-shirt and had a chocolate croissant because I was still hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was the end, that was the end of living like the other half live uh, for... <laughs> Uh, but I was supposed to go back this year to do another another one as a return because they, they get a new master of ceremonies in each year. And the speaker from the year before has to go back, but not to do at all, just to be a guest. Of course, it's not happened, has it? So. Mm -hmm. And the, the nearest I came to that was uh, dinner at Admiralty House with the Home yeah. Secretary. Uh, and this was on the stand down after the stand down of the United Kingdom Warning and Monitoring Organisation. Um, the only problem was I, I, I was a teacher and the Home Secretary was Kenneth Baker and we actually <laughs> hated him. <sighs> so they didn't say I was a teacher. Um, they said, I, I'm trying to think what they said instead. But they, they, oh, they, I, was, I was good at computing because I was in, into computers, the BBC and things mm -hmm. and those sort of days. But they didn't mention too much that I, that I was a teacher. So, I was very strong in the NUT as well, and we didn't like Kenneth Baker. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was a very nice meal. <laughs> well, mine wasn't. Well, it was, I suppose. It was very expensive, I would imagine, but there was only little bits. You know, right. good <laughs> feed of them. In um, I said to Sib, I says, in, going back in the ta in the in the Mercedes, I said, do you think you'll stop off at a chippy? I said, I'm starving. <laughs> And of course, I get drunk very, very easily. Um, you know, I've only got to sniff the cork and I've had it. And of course, I got all this really expensive wine. And of course, I was the last one to get up and talk. I didn't, I couldn't really drink anything because I thought if I get up, if I keep drinking, because every course, they, they had, I think it's eight courses, every course, they give you a different type of wine. And I thought if I have a drink of wine with every course, by the time I get up, I'll be absolutely hammered. <laughs> I thought I'd better not. Uh, I'll make a fool of myself. So I didn't drink all night, and I thought I missed out there, really. But uh, it was an experience, um, and probably an experience I'll never, ever. Uh, and when I got the email to do it, I thought they would, somebody was sent me some spam, you know, that they said, <laughs> we, we cordially invite you to talk at the Mansion House, Queen's residence, on such and such uh, town residence, on such and such a date. And I thought, somebody's taking the mick here. And I just ignored it. And then I was doing a talk down in the south of England and this guy tapped me on the shoulder. He says, you haven't answered my, you haven't answered my email yet. I said, what email? He says, about doing the talk at Mansion House. I thought, this is for real. Uh, so I went and did it. Never looked back. It's always been, it was good fun. And I made sure that Rick Armstrong got a pack of them cards as well, for, uh, obviously to remember his dad. Anyway, I shall... Uh, well, thanks very much, Pete. That was really, really informative. Excellent. Yeah. And it's given Excellent. us a lot to think about in that as well. Okay. Yeah. So, like I say, if you're stuck for anything, just give me a shout. And uh, I've got plenty of time on my hands. So I'm always here. If you want to ask any questions, have a one to one Zoom. If you want me to just talk about music and astronomy, whatever, I'm, 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 I'm at a loose end. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so just give me a shout. I'll see you all soon. Right. Okay. Bye. Brilliant. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Right. Right. Um, is Charlie there? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Aye. Yeah.
Yeah, so, I, so yeah, I just had a chat with uh, Alex Amanda after last week's meeting. I was just caught, I think maybe we all were caught a bit off guard by Lembit Opitz, um rant, you might say, <laughs> having a go at um, Greta Thunberg for some reason, suggesting she's got an illness and she's got Asperger's, which is not an illness. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, describing climate activists as being members of a religious cult. I mean, I may have this all wrong because it's not been recorded and it was just sort of um, a bit of a surprise, so maybe I'm, I've got the wrong impression, but uh, it certainly seems to um, belittle the effects of or the, the effects of climate change and the, the predicted effects of climate change. I mean, obviously, it's part of that asteroid detection um, and you know, risk avoidance taught by Duncan, it was that it was clear that that resources are required, you know, to look, you know, the, the, the resources are required to look at asteroid detection and um, and the risks of asteroids because it could be obviously cat catastrophic. But you see, it seemed to me he was saying that. There's far too much money being spent on on looking at climate change and mitigating climate change, and this should be sort of deferred to asteroid uh, research because that's going to be more cataclysmic. So um, I, I was disappointed in myself that I didn't respond, you know, because um, I was just thinking I just maybe all were just taken off guard a little bit. I think it's, it's a shame that someone didn't come back and say, "What the bloody hell are you talking about?" <laughs> Well, I haven't got the wrong impression. I mean, was that everybody else's impression? Because yeah. I, I was yeah. shocked, you know. Yeah. I was quite shocked. Sorry, can I interrupt <laughs> just a second? I, I was recording up until now. If we're going to be saying anything contentious <laughs> up on the web, shall I stop the recording? I think so, I. Yeah.